Bolovidaka, uh, aloha, uh, warm Pacific greetings to you, to you all. I hope you can uh, hear me okay uh, in uh, New Mea, New Caledonia. I wish I uh, would have been there in person, uh, but as uh, Marianne has just mentioned, I've just been, um, uh, I'm calling in right now from uh, Los Angeles, and I've just started a new role, and uh, I would not be able uh, to be there in person. And I wish you all uh, the very best um, in this uh, conference. Okay, so I will uh, share my uh, PowerPoint, and I'm sure, Marianne, there will be a a timekeeper on your side. I'm also keeping my time so I can have enough time at the end uh, for some Q&A. So just uh, to, before I share my screen, I just wanted to share that my sharing today uh, is based on my personal experience of working in the Pacific, and it will be delivered in a storytelling fashion in which I will share um, some of the work that we are doing uh, to counter some of the challenges uh, that uh, museums in the Pacific are going through right now. And thank you so much for your time uh, for being here today. I greet you all from the land of the Tongva people on which the California State University in Los Angeles is built. I bring along the greetings of our fellow museum comrades from across the Temuana Nuyakiwa, this vast place that we call Oceania. Thank you so much to the organizers of this conference for inviting me to share my story with you all. And I hope that uh, you can learn something from my presentation today. And I hope that I can also learn from you. In the traditional way, I'm originally from Fiji, I will greet you in my language. Nisambul binaka, naedangu otarisi bunindilo, angone nikandavu, na nongu koro onatoklao, na nongu koro nibasu onukunuku, na nongu matenitu onburambasanga. So I've just introduced myself in my language to all of you. Firstly, my name and where I come from. I come from a beautiful island uh, here on this map. It's called Kandavu. And on this island is my dad's village, which is the village called Natokalau. And I also have my mom's village on the same island, which is called Nukunuku. And Fiji is divided into three confederacies, Kumbuna, Burimbasanga, and Tovata. I belong so I bring all the love from Fiji and from my island Kandavu to you all. So as we look at this slide, we're looking at this vast ocean, the Temuana Nui Akiwa, a place that we call home. And as I look at this map, I remember the words of the late Professor Epeli Hawafa. And these were his words that he shared decades ago, and it's still relevant to us today. And it's, it reads, Oceania is vast, Oceania is expanding. Oceania is hospitable and gen generous. Oceania is humanity rising from the depths of brine and regions of fire deeper still. Oceania is us. We are the sea. We are the ocean, unquote. The Professor Epeli Haofa was also one of my teachers at the University of the South Pacific. And I always remember his beautiful words of empowerment for many of us who are originally or are of indigenous descent from this beautiful place, which we call Oceania. And I also am reminded of another quote, which is so uplifting for me. You know, sometimes when I feel down 
in my area of work, I always remember this. And I quote, we should not be defined by the smallness of our islands and in the greatness of our oceans. We are the sea, we are the ocean, Oceania is us, unquote. I also bring with me the love of the Pacific Island Museum Association president, uh, Joseph Cameron from Guam and the rest of the board members and Marianne Tissendier, who is the host of this conference, is a board member as well. Thank you so much, Marianne, for the wonderful work that you do. So for Pima, it's a regional organization that uh, brings all the museums and cultural centers together as one. And one thing that I often am reminded of is this, is which countries are included under Pima, or how does this organization Pima include the different islands in the Pacific? And uh, in our constitution and also in our uh, Pima code of ethics, this is where I got this information from. And I thought this will be a good place to start our conversation today because we're talking about Pacific museums and we're talking about Pacific people. So in our Pima constitution, it talks about the Pacific Islands that are included under the organization also includes Australia and New Zealand and all the Pacific Islands, states and territories. When it comes to the definition of museum, that is how uh, in our Pima code of ethics and also our constitution, that's how it is defined. That the Pima looks after any museum that includes any cultural center, cultural institution, cultural organization, cultural association, and interpretive centers. So by looking at this uh, um, definition of museum, you can see that it's kind of different maybe from other uh, definitions of museums in other parts of the world. But for me personally, I'm very happy in this case in which a museum is not just a building on its own, it also involves other organizations that do a very important work in the community. And in the Pima Constitution, these are also eight important points that is highlighted in this document. And I thought I'd list them out. And if you look at point one, you can see that the first focus of this organization and also our museums in the Pacific is people. And everything else comes after that. And there's a reason why I wanted to highlight this. So, the importance of my presentation today, I wanted to highlight five key points initially before I go into the content of my keynote. Pacific museums are number one, people focused. Number two, many museums are trying their very best to highlight local and indigenous languages in the work that they do. Number three, I'm pleased to say that many museums are also looking at indigenizing their museum spaces. And this is something to celebrate and also a shift in the way museums in the Pacific do their work. Number four, definitely museums in the Pacific, we have so many challenges, but for me, I would look at solutions, but also reminding all of us to also celebrate our achievements. Because many times we often talk about the many challenges, but sometimes we hardly celebrate. But I think in my presentation today, I would like to highlight some challenges, but also look at solutions and some celebrations and looking at what some other museums are doing to counter these challenges. And lastly, I would like to say that the museums in the Pacific they're going through changes. It's very different from when the museum started in the early 1900s. Many of the museums are now not only focused on collections or conservations or community outreach, but now they're also responsible for the management of world heritage sites. Some of these museums are also responsible for managing archeological and anthropological research in their country. 
So I just wanted to say that now we can see that many museums in the Pacific, their role is changing. And now that we focus on point one, that the museum is very people focused, I remember one of the uh, whakatauki or proverb from New Zealand, from Aotearoa, where I spent 16 years of my life before I moved to Hawaii. And this is one of my favorite proverbs, and I read it, I quote, He aha te mea nui o te au, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. What is the most important thing in the world? It is the people, it is the people, it is the people. And to me, from my experience of working in the museum sector in the Pacific region, I'm pleased to say that many of our museum staff and the way they work every day is focused on the people that they serve in the community. A few months ago, I was invited to discuss uh, the definition by ICOM on the definition of museums. And this was one of the definitions I really gravitate towards. And I've highlighted a few words and I've underlined people as well. And it reads, a museum is an open and accessible not-for-profit institution that collects, researches, preserves, exhibits, and communicates the tangible and intangible heritage of people and the environment for the benefit of society. Museums are committed to ethical and sustainable practices and are operated in an inclusive and professional manner to create enjoyable and educational experiences that foster curiosity and discovery. So you can see again, the word people is underlined there. And for me personally, that is something that I'm very proud to say that reflects the work that we do in the Pacific for many of our Pacific museums. So I just wanted to say uh, my paper today is divided into three parts. So this is part one, where I will just share a little bit about the island heritages of Oceania. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with our part of the world, but I thought I wanted to share a little bit of our world to you. And uh, I will share a little bit about the natural heritage of the Pacific, the cultural heritage, and also the tangible and the intangible cultural heritage. The second part of my talk, I'll be talking about what are some of the challenges that we face in Oceania? And part three, we'll be looking at what are some solutions that are currently working, and maybe we can share some of those solutions from the audience and also those of you who are listening online. So in terms of the natural heritage of the Pacific, um, the region actually has three world largest sites of natural heritage. And it's good to see as well that many of these natural heritage are uh, protected under the World Heritage uh, Center. Um, and it's really good to see. So the three that uh, I could say that are included in this, uh, in the world, the largest sites in the world, and are from our part of the world, is the Phoenix Islands protected area, that's in the Kiribati area above the equator. The second one is Papaha Naumokuakea in Hawaii. And the third one is the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And so it's really wonderful to highlight the importance of these um, natural uh, heritage sites because for us indigenous people in the Pacific, uh, even though uh, in, today's, they, in today's time, you know, there's a, a division between natural and cultural, or sometimes, you know, the nature and culture are separated, but for us, they were one. Yeah, so in many times, a lot of these natural sites uh, one thing that is very important to us is, of course, the place names, the names that apply to the reefs, to the names that apply to the ocean, to the mountains, to the rivers. So names are so important. And that's why in my discussion today, I will also highlight the importance of language. And I have a number of uh, photos here that I would like to highlight about some of the world heritage sites in our part of the world. And the reason why I wanted to share this is that 
many of our Pacific Island museums, as I was saying earlier on, apart from the collections work they do inside the museums, the conservation work, the collections work, the education work, they also have staff who have background in making sure that they manage or communicate with researchers that come in to manage some of these World Heritage Sites. So we're gonna travel around the Pacific for free. So I will share with you some photos and some pictures for us to acknowledge the wonderful work that many of these museums, many of them underfunded, but they do it out of passion. The first one is the Cook Early Agricultural Site in Papua New Guinea. So this is one of our first World Heritage Site and uh, the staff of the Papua New Guinea National Museum in Port Mosby, they have staff that also helps in managing these sites. And these are some pictures uh, of the work that was done. This goes back to the 1950s and acknowledging the many archeologists uh, that did their work back then and have put Papua New Guinea and the whole region in the world map when it comes to um, agricultural civilization, right? So when we hear about civilization, you only hear about maybe Egypt or uh, Mesopotamia, hello, we can also talk about agricultural um, civilization in our backyard in Papua New Guinea. So that's the first site. The second one is in the Solomon Islands. It's one of our natural uh, heritage site, the Morovo Lagoon. And I wanna highlight this, that one of the challenges uh, on this particular site is deforestation. As you know that in uh, Solomon Islands, they have some really rich uh, forestry Unfortunately, through the cutting of the trees, uh, there's a lot of flooding and a lot of uh, soil leaching that goes into the Morovo Lagoon. So that is another challenge uh, that we faced with that even though we're trying to hold on to our natural heritage site, the economic pressure from the governments are making some of this natural heritage site come under threat. So I thought I mentioned that. And I'm sure in the next three days or four in this conference, some of you will be talking about that as well. The third site is the Chief Ray Martyr's domain in Vanuatu. Um, and this uh, um, Ray Martyr domain uh, covers the island of Efate, and you go across to the island of Eretoka and also the island of Lelepa. And it's amazing again. And the reason why I'm showing you that this World Heritage Site managed by UNESCO with the help of the UNESCO office in Paris, they also have staff at the Vanuatu Cultural Center that are mandated to manage the sites. So some of the challenges here would be um, staff training, uh, also climate, you know, the, the changes of the weather and all of that that I will talk about later on. But I thought I'd just share some of these challenges as we go through some of these World Heritage Sites. Now we go to Fiji. Recently, uh, Levuka became the uh, historical port town and it was recognized by UNESCO, um, I think in 2016. So just very recently, but it has been in the process for a couple of decades before it was accepted into the World Heritage family. Also, as you travel up to Micronesia, we have the Rock Islands. I uh, know many of you would have traveled to the Rock Islands. Uh, there's about 445 uninhabited limestone islands there, and now it's also protected. And we really want to acknowledge Palau. Uh, they've really set uh, a very wonderful example for us with the management of their um, natural resources through the support and the help of the staff of the Belau National Museum. So again, another good example of how staff of the Bishop, uh, sorry, the Belau National Museum are helping out. As we travel over to Polynesia, uh, we go to Rapa Nui, uh, the national park, as we know that we have the Moai site over there, um, and it's good to know that it is well recognized and also protected for our future generations. So this was declared uh, as a World Heritage Site in 1996. And so we talked about the natural heritage, and now let's go to the cultural heritage. And so uh, a lot of our uh, museums are now uh, looking after a lot of our beautiful cultural artifacts. Um, one thing that is very unique in our part of the world is the importance of trying to pass on this knowledge to the younger generation. However, 
It is also a challenge. I will share this as a challenge because there is a huge gap between the passing of the knowledge from the older generation to the younger generation. So in this picture, these are the pictures of uh, uh, universities here in uh, California, in which they are studying the tapa cloth and sharing the knowledge with our younger generation. And we need to do more of that. So you can see that museums are now working hand in hand with academic institution. And that's something we need to encourage museums to also work with universities and other colleges so we can share the knowledge and pass on the knowledge to the younger generation, our future. The other aspect of uh, cultural heritage I wanna talk about very quickly is the um, intangible cultural heritage, our songs, our dances. Um, and this is uh, an example in Tonga. In 2008, they were able to inscribe their Laka Laka song or Laka Laka dance. It's a very special dance, but it is actually sung poetry. It is sung speeches that are only performed to the king of Tonga. Not only that, we also have to celebrate Vanuatu. On the same year, in 2008, Vanuatu also inscribed the Vanuatu sand drawing, the art of sand drawing, into UNESCO. So again, there is another feature that is very important for many Pacific Island museums in which they also contribute their staff and their knowledge for the protection of intangible cultural heritage. And so I just wanted to share very quickly here the importance of um, this image that we're looking at. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Lapita. Uh, the word Lapita comes from Kone uh, in New Caledonia. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Christoph Sand and his team uh, for their amazing hard work over so many decades uh, in um, looking after a lot of our uh, Lapita sites. So the image that you can see here, you can see that in many museums in the Pacific, since the early 1900s, with the increase of archaeological research in the Pacific, such objects that you're looking at are important to scientists as well as local communities. Now, one point I would like to share that this particular image reflects two groups of people, the researchers and the local communities. So I wanted to highlight another feature of Pacific Island museums is that we feature living cultures. So this picture here, we can show you a 3000 year old evidence of human habitation in the Pacific, but it also brings it to today that right at this very moment as we speak, we have porters that are still making pottery in Fiji, in Vanuatu, in Solomon Islands, and also in Papua New Guinea. And so here, the main point I wanted to share that many of our Pacific Island uh, uh, museums are shifting the way they're doing their work, not just only focusing on display, not just focusing on collections or conservation or classification. They're also shifting the work that they do. They are now capturing the local stories. They are making this Lapita pottery relevant. Another point that I would like to share is the importance of architecture in museums. And this comes to one of my points that I was sharing earlier, the indigenization of museum spaces. So the picture on the left is the Papua New Guinea National Museum in Port Mosby. And the picture on the right is the Vanuatu Cultural Center in Port Vila. And so what the main point that I would like to share here is how our museums and our identity is translated into our buildings. It's translated into our local style. It's translated into our local vernacular, something that represents our everyday life and our everyday people. And so what I would like to highlight as well is that as a result, many of our museums are beginning to work with local people to communicate, to tell them that your local skills of building your local knowledge of trees and plants, the sources of these materials are important. And we need to celebrate our material culture. We need to celebrate our gender and our tribal customs. 
And this is something that is very unique in our part of the world. Let us travel across now to the Solomon Islands. And I would like to share this example from the Solomon Islands because it is very important here that um, in Honiara, which is the capital where this museum is built, the Solomon Island government built this museum to preserve local artifacts against being lost. Now, of course, there will be fears that a culture is lost as its objects are taken away. And so there grows a closer identification with the objects of the culture. And secondly, what is important in this building that we're looking at, the Solomon Island Museum is looking at informing the rest of the world of the importance of local languages. So not only that they look at the artifacts itself, they are emphasizing that it's really critical to also promote the local languages of the Solomon Islands. So this museum is now a repository of local knowledge that will enhance a sense of belonging and pride among the people of the Solomon Islands. So from the Solomon Islands, let's travel across to the Cook Islands, very similar to the Solomon Islands. The Cook Islands are also doing the same thing. They're using the same formula to cultivate local talents and skills so they can include weaving skills and cooking skills from traditional women's work and bringing it into the museum so that the memory of this culture is not lost. And again, the word pride comes into this discussion. It enters into the museum statement that it is very important for the local Cook Islanders to be proud of their workmanship and their handiwork. And guess what? The museum plays a very important role. And also, now that we can um, go over to the Fiji Museum, uh, this was the place where I worked in as a uh, Marian, I read my um, bio. I started working here uh, in 1994 after I graduated from uh, the Fiji University of the South Pacific. Now, one thing that is very interesting about the Fiji Museum is that there is an element of diversity, but it has some contradiction. And there's a reason why I say that. In Fiji, as you all know, uh, we have 50% of indigenous Itauke people in which this canoe that you're looking at is represented. And we also have a 50% population of the Indian uh, people that came in 1879 under the colonial government of Great Britain, because you know that Fiji is was a British colony. And so um, the question is, how would a museum represent their community in a very honest way if they only represent the indigenous people only. For me as an indigenous people myself, I find that unfair. We need to also share the stories of our Chinese brothers and sisters. We also need to showcase the stories of our Banaban people on the island of Rambi. We also need to share the stories of our brothers and sisters on the island of Kioa who originally came from Tuvalu. And so in 1994, under the leadership of Kate Wusoniwailala, the previous director of the Fiji Museum, currently the chair of the board of the Fiji Museum, this happened. They created an Indo-Fijian gallery. So this Indo-Fijian gallery was sponsored by the Indian and multi-ethnic affairs department. And one point that I wanted to share here, that museums, are not static. Museums in the Pacific are adaptable. Museums in the Pacific are shifting their uh, course of action. So when there was a need to represent our indo gallery, our indo people rather, they build this indo gallery. So this is uh, um, you know, some examples of uh, what some of our museums are doing today uh, that I wanted to share with all of you. So let us go to my second part of my presentation. And uh, this one is looking at challenges, ladies and gentlemen. As you know, the Pacific is not free 
from problems. We're not free from challenges. Yes, we have a long list. I will read out a couple of lists, a couple from the list. Number one, fishing agreements yeah, that, are, that fail. Deforestation, an example that we just saw in the Solomon Islands. Political pressures, vagaries of nature that includes earthquakes and cyclones, and also the problem of non-communicable diseases, and the list goes on. Now, for the sake of our sharing today, I wanted to only share with you three challenges that I think that could inspire you in the next couple of days in which you can be able to discuss in your own uh, groups or in your own sessions. And I hope that my talk today I will inspire you in that regard. So the first example that you see here, one of my first um, uh, um, challenge is geographical isolation. Yeah, so we all agree with that. And uh, number two, the issue of decolonization. Yeah, so many of our island nations are still under colonial rule, and many of them are still trying to um, you know, gain their independence. And also those who are independent still have some colonial hangover in their museums. And so uh, most of the time they're trying to get away from the way Western museums operate, in which they're trying to indigenize their space. The third issue or challenge that I that I wanted to share is the generational knowledge gap within our own Pacific communities. And so in yellow, as you can see there, I've highlighted solutions. So the first challenge is geographical isolation. One of the solution is digital repatriation. Second challenge, decolonization. One of the solution is looking at programs that indigenize some of our collections and also our museum spaces. And I will share in my next couple of slides, two examples of what we did in Hawaii to respond to that challenge. And number three, yes, there's a huge generational knowledge gap between the older generation and the younger generation. What can museums do to reduce that gap? And one of the solution is community collaboration. And I have one example to share with you, and I hope that you can learn from it too. Let's look at the first one here. So we all know this is not um, uh, this is not um, a new information. So we are geographically, you know, really isolated. Um, you know, from many places, a lot of our island nations are very small, uh, and of course, with environmental issues that uh, most of you will be discussing as well in your own sessions are there. Um, what should we do about it? So one of my solutions, thanks to COVID-19, is again, the use of technology. The other question we have, how accessible are these technology to us? For me, I would always look at what can we do and make use of now? What do we have now? So at the moment, we have telecommunication, right? Companies that are offering services to us, like Digicel and uh, Vodafone and some other local um, telecommunication companies. Now, this is one example that I wanted to share with you, all of you, is a digital repatriation project that happened between the Fiji Museum and the Museum of Victoria in Melbourne. So definitely there's a geographical divide, but one of the solution is bringing in technology to reduce that divide. The second challenge is decolonization. For me personally, I don't usually use this word a lot. I often use the word indigenization. For me, as an indigenous person, I can bring my indigenous voice into the museum space to use it as a tool of empowerment. Challenge number three. Yes, as I said, uh, said earlier on, generation knowledge gap. It is increasing every day as we speak. What can we do to reduce that gap? What can museums do to reduce that gap? What can archives do to reduce that gap? What can libraries do to reduce that gap? Yes, it can be reduced. It all comes down to community collaboration. So the third part of my presentation is looking at what are some of the opportunities that we can apply to 
take away or maybe reduce the impact of some of these challenges. So now let's go into each of these solutions. Are you ready? The first one, as I said before, the geographical isolation, the technological divide. Yes, we can use technology to benefit us in the region. It worked with us in Fiji, and I hope it can also work in other parts of the Pacific. So let us look at this project here that I was um, talking about that happened in 1999. This project was the first of its kind to take place in the Pacific. The portal of the Museum of Victoria and the Fiji Museum is an online collaboration that presents Fijian artifacts located at the Museum of Victoria in Australia to be available online. Instead of these artifacts to be physically returned to Fiji, both museums agreed that due to restricted availability of space at the Fiji Museum, making these images available online was the best way forward. As online visitors click on photographs of these artifacts, pictures of stories are revealed. Not only did the museums want to show the fine ornaments that are made from shell, from teeth, and bones, they also want to show the context of ritual and social use of priest oil dishes and cover bowls that are made from finer sacred woods called vesi. The intricacies of bark cloth production and their rituals were also presented online. So ladies and gentlemen, I just wanna present to you one of the solutions that some of our Pacific Island museums are doing to counter the um, challenge of the digital divide, plus also the geographical isolation that many of our islands are facing on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is a very good example that I want to share with you. If it worked for Fiji, I'm sure it can work for other island nations. Let us look at the second one on the topic of um, decolonization. It's a big challenge. Right, Many of you uh, would understand where I'm coming from. Even using that word, most of you know uh, the definition. But this was a solution that we put together. When I say we, it was a team of us that came together in January to July of last year. There was a Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Museum Institute that we organized digitally because of COVID-19. Most of our uh, island um, curators and staff would not be able to travel because of restrictions, but we use technology to our advantage. And uh, what we decided to do, we're gonna meet online for five months, week in, week out, week in, week out, just one day a week, every Monday. And then in July, all of these beautiful people on the screen, they all flew to Hawaii and we met in person. And we spent one whole month of empowerment in which we all share and talked about so many ways of indigenizing conservation, indigenizing exhibition, indigenizing collections management. And it was a wonderful time in which many of these the first cohort of uh, our museum staff from all around the Pacific were able to be present face-to-face, uh, -face. but this is our first cohort and we hope, ladies and gentlemen, that we can continue this Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Museum Institute in 2025 and beyond. And this is all depending on funding, which is another challenge. But for this one, we were really uh, happy that the uh, National Endowment uh, Fund organization here in the US uh, provided us with uh, 350,000 US dollars so that we can be able to run this workshop successfully. So I'd like to um, acknowledge uh, Noel Kahanu, um, also our colleagues here, uh, Helena Kapuni Reynolds, Eric Chang and Dr. Karen Kosasa. We were the key people that facilitated this amazing uh, museum institute. So that is one of the solution. How can we indigenize our, indigenize our space? We can run workshops like this. Another solution that I would like to provide when it comes to uh, technological divide um, uh, is to provide 
cultural competency workshop. So this was an example of what we did, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in 2020 uh, during the COVID-19. Uh, we were given some funds from the Hawaii Tourism Association and we decided to, uh, we were supposed to travel all, all the islands of Hawaii, but because of COVID, uh, we were not able to do so. And so um, we uh, were able to run this workshop online. Again, technology to the rescue. So I just wanted to highlight that uh, this cultural competency workshop was an online webinar and uh, we were able to meet online um, and talk about uh, a framework as you can see on the screen. So we talk about cultural competency as a framework for fostering meaningful relations between museum workers and cultural practitioners. So the way we indigenize these sessions, we were able to bring in wood covers, stone covers, tapa makers, um, the artists to come in and share their knowledge. And then our staff from the museum came in, some of them were Hawaiian, some of them were non-Hawaiian, but we were able to be empowered because this was an opportunity where we can talk about issues to do with museum collections face to face. So it was wonderful. And these were some of the things we did. We uh, focused on the island of Kauai, uh, we also traveled digitally to the island of Hawaii, the big island. And also we traveled to the island of Maui and Molokai. So I just thought I'd share uh, this wonderful example of something that we did as a way of indigenizing museum spaces. Now to my last point. The last point I wanted to share is that uh, um, to do with the generation knowledge gap. And this is a wonderful example from the Auckland Museum. and. Uh, I'll show you a couple of pictures. So I would like to acknowledge Fuli Pereira, uh, my colleague at the Auckland Museum. She's an ethnology, ethno, ethno, ethnology curator. She's originally from Tokelau. And um, they were able to propose this project in which artists from the community can come over to add to the information in the museum. So as you can see, these are uh, knowledge holders from the Cook Islands. They're looking at the TVI. And as a result of this collaboration, they were able to put in Cook Island words onto the database. They were able to um, put the Cook Island words as the first word. So TYY patch quilt, right? Rather than patch quilt Cook Islands. So it was a really wonderful example in which the indigenous language was highlighted. And also not only that the Pacific Collection Access Project only happened in New Zealand, the spirit of it went across the Tasman Sea. So this is our sister from the Australian Museum in Sydney with the president of Kiribati, in which now um, most of the Pacific collections can be opened to heads of state, uh, members of the community, and also not forgetting our youths. It's very important that our young people are shared uh, this very important information from our collection. And more work here and it's just amazing that a lot of our people are able to share a lot of this information digitally through our podcast, through our websites. And this is myself and Albert Trail and Choana Monolangi. The three of us worked for one year to go through 1,500, no, 1,700 artifacts from Fiji. And this is a beautiful picture I'd like to share with you and I'm gonna end very soon is to do with our children. Not only the artifacts were shown, but also the ph photographs from the collections. And so again, this is one way in which we can invite our local people to come in and our elders can be able to share their memories and our young ones as well can be able to gain some knowledge and understanding and for them to be proud of who they are. So to conclude uh, my presentation today, I have a short video that I would like to share with you to end my presentation. So I will unshare and let me share my video. And I will be open to answer any questions or comments from the members of our conference today. So I will share my screen. One more time. Thank you so much for listening to me. And I hope that uh, you have uh, 
been inspired uh, with some of the topics that I've shared today, um, the challenges and also the solutions. So this is the uh, short video from the work that we did at the Auckland Museum, and I hope that you will enjoy it. Kina metando la nada ni ni wasali wa meula i rongo basai na li wa nada baya do ebe tikina. Au sa na da buta na bosa i o non duin duin ake na i rongo rongo moni ti komanda moni sato. So moni ti komanda moni sato. So moni ti komanda moni sa. Kokina metando la nada ni ni wasali wa meula i rongo vosai na li wa nada baya do ebe tikina. Au sa na da buta na vosa i o non duin duin a ke na i rongo rongo moni ti komanda moni sato. So moni ti komanda moni sato. So moni ti komanda moni sa. Au sa na da buta na vosa i o non duin duin a ke na i rongo rongo moni ti komanda moni sato. So moni ti komanda moni sato. So moni ti komanda moni sa. Ulu ingala u kau ti koki na metando la na da ni ni wa saliwa me u la i rongo vosa i na liwa. Nada vaya do e bei tikina. Au sa na da buta na vosa i o non duin duin a ke na i rongo rongo moni ti komanda moni sato. So moni ti komanda moni sato. So moni ti komanda moni sa. Au sa na da buta na vosa i o non duin duin a ke na i rongo rongo moni ti komanda moni sato. So moni ti komanda moni sato. So moni ti komanda moni sa. Ulu ingala u kau ti koki na metando la na da ni ni wa sali wa me u la i rongo vosa i na li wa na da baya be ti kina. Au sa na da buta na vosa i o non duin duin a ke na i rongo rongo moni ti komanda moni sato. So moni ti komanda moni sato. So moni ti komanda moni sa. Au sa na da buta na vosa i o non duin duin a ke na i rongo rongo moni ti koma. And thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Marielle, and uh, Messi Buk. Um, thank you very, very much, Tarisi. It was a very great presentation, a great introduction as well for uh, many people who are not from the Pacific. And even for those who are from the Pacific, it was uh, really awesome. So do we have any questions in the in the room? Euh, pardon, je le dis en français. Euh, <rire> merci beaucoup, Tarissi, pour, pour cette présentation. Alors, pour ceux qui ne viennent pas du Pacifique, bien sûr, c'est incroyable. Et pour ceux qui y sont, ça nous rappelle beaucoup de choses. Et bah, c'est toujours très émouvant de voir tous ces objets et tout ce travail effectué euh, en Océanie. Est-ce que vous avez des questions Est-ce que des gens ont des questions pour Tarissi
Allô Oui, bonjour. Moi, j'aurais une petite question par rapport à, à la troisième solution pour le travail avec tout ce qui était intergénérationnel. J'aurais aimé savoir quel est le résultat. Est-ce qu'il y a eu euh, quand même euh, des jeunes qui se sont intéressés et comment ça s'est passé Mm. Oui, Pascal. Hello, uh, Tarisi, did you hear the question or do you want me uh, to... to... Yeah, would you like to translate for me? Yes, uh, so uh, Chanel, <laughs> Chanel here, he was at the city of Numia and she's a uh, public programs and she's working on conservation as well. Uh, she's asking if you, we, for your uh, work uh, for the with the, the elders and the young uh, generation, uh, did you see some results and they, did, are you already... Uh, seeing results with these programs? Did it work or, I mean, do you have any uh, advice? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for the question. Yes, in terms of the, um, you know, the, the generational uh, knowledge gap, uh, we have seen um, even some examples, some uh, um, results uh, within families themselves. For example, um, children now are interested to go to museums. Um, you know, before that, uh, as you know, I'm one uh, of the generation in which uh, I was not allowed to go to museums. The museum was only for tourists, right? That was what I was told. But after this program that we had at the Auckland Museum, um, those who came to our open days, uh, those who came to our programs that we organized at the museum, there was repeat visitation there was evidence of them coming back and coming back. So that is one direct evidence. The other one I would like to share is that the, the project that we did at the Auckland Museum, we also used social media to our advantage. Before that, remember, before that, many of our museums in the Pacific, we were not allowed right to share information digitally even on social media i remember i was not allowed to take my camera i have to wear my gloves you know all those rules that we all know that to those of us who work in the museum but when i was working on this project the auckland museum team allowed us to take our own photos and put it on social media and guess what happened there was discussions and questions from young people on Facebook, on Twitter, on uh, Instagram. And it was fascinating to see the live feed as older people were answering the questions of the younger ones. And so those are some of the few that I could think of, but the results was endless and positive and uplifting because a lot of our people, as you all know, you know, museums is not a normal place we go to, right? We would rather go to the mall or to the movies uh, rather than going to the museum. But from this project alone, a lot of children just have the pride to be from Niue, from the Cook Islands, from Papua New Guinea, and even for them, you know, when I was there to represent Fiji, there were so many children smiling and just proud to be Fijian. And so those are some examples. And if your museum can do it, I give you all my blessing. Thank you very much, Tarisi. Um, on your uh, application, on the Zoom application, there is a little um, uh, word. And then if you click on it, uh, it's, I don't know if you can see it, it's uh, over there. And you can have, uh, it says interpretation, I think, or translations. And then you will have, uh, when people speak in French, you will have the translation in English. Um, anybody has question? Quelqu'un a une autre question? The beginning of the, the day, so people are very quiet and very shy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have another question. To, welcome to come to Hawaii. Uh, I'll be happy to share some of our uh, uh, websites um, for with I'll share it with Marianne if some of you are interested to know about the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Museum Institute and if anyone wants to know about the cultural competency workshops um, and also the Pacific Collection Access Project. Those are three projects that I personally was involved in and it just really contributed to something that I personally 
you know, very strong feelings for, which is indigenizing our museum spaces. And it is empowering, you know, empowering for our communities, empowering for our museum staff. You know, we can be able to add more languages in there, you know, the Uver language, the Walesian language, and you can add in, you know, the French and the English, the more the merrier. So we have a question. Oui, euh, bonjour déjà euh, Tarassi et puis merci euh, pour cette présentation. Euh, moi, ma question, c'est sur l'implication des, euh, des autochtones. Et je voulais savoir euh, la méthodologie et sur euh, le plan euh, financement, comment ils financent euh, ces opérations. In, in, in English mm -hmm. You, you got the question in English, it's fine? Uh, oh, no. Do you no, want me? no. Oh. Yes, please, okay. Marianne. Uh, okay, so uh, that's uh, Romaric Nea, who's uh, head of uh, museums in the northern province of Numia. And he's asking about uh, the indigenization of uh, museums. Uh, how do you get funding? Are there specific ways of getting funding? But also, uh, what is the, the process and, you know, like tips or things to, that you do for to help with that uh, with that issue? Oh, thank you and so he much. Thanks, and he thanks you, for, of course, uh, also. Oh, thank you. Yeah, merci beaucoup. Uh, yes, um, the funding, um, there are so many, so many funding streams that are available. So because I live in the United States, uh, we have the, uh, nat uh, the um, uh, National Endowment Fund. Uh, NEH, it's it's in short, uh, that gives uh, funding. Um, they come in small amounts like 5,000, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000, and uh, up to 500,000. So a lot of money uh, that you can access. So I'll be very happy uh, to share the, the links to some of the funding uh, that I have if you're interested. So Marianne can give you my uh, contact details and I'll be happy to share with you, particularly for the one for the Native um, Hawaiian Pacific Island uh, um, uh, Museum Institute. We got $350,000. That's a lot of money. And we were really happy that we were able to not only do one workshop, we also went, we had leftover money and we were able to go to Saipan in Northern uh, Marianas to do a second workshop with our uh, folks that were not able to come to Hawaii last year. So uh, that's a, a stream of funding. Uh, the one for uh, the uh, competency workshop that we did in Hawaii as well, we got funding from the Hawaii Tourism Association. So maybe you might have a New Caledonia uh, Tourism Association, uh, Association or a New Mayor or, you know, something like that for tourism, under tourism. We got funding from them. So, you know, you can um, you apply, use your, you know, how you put your application together to, con to connect heritage and tourism. Uh, and education together, because it works really well. And it was amazing, the support. Uh, we got, uh, I think if I remembered, uh, I think we had about 50,000 US uh, that we got for that. And then for Auckland, uh, we had funding through um, the uh, Auckland Museum. So the Auckland Museum, they put uh, a grant aside for three years, um, which was a lot of money. I think it was I can't remember the amount, of, it was about $750,000. It was a huge, close to a million uh, dollars that they put aside to cater for 14 nations for three years. So it was a long project, but there was a project manager and uh, they were able to uh, connect with the communities to come in and do the work. So yes, the answer, yes, funding is there. You have to, uh, you know, do the search and find out which funding is available. So you can either go down the tourism authority way, or you go down your cultural organization or ministry of culture, or you can go through your uh, museum and go up the channel to tell them that these are the projects you want to do from 2025 to 2030, and you put your application now. Thank you very much. Um, Est-ce qu'il y a une dernière question? Last question, perhaps? Okay. Oh, last question. Merci. Euh, merci pour la présentation. Euh, J'ai beaucoup apprécié le, la phrase que vous avez citée tout à l'heure. Nous ne nous définissons pas par la petitesse de notre ville par la grandeur de notre océan, parce que nous appartenons à l'océan. 
Ma question est la suivante. Comment protéger notre patrimoine matériel et immatériel face à la mondialisation, face au, à la venue des autres puissances internationales Voilà, merci. Um, so if you didn't hear the question, uh, it was how to protect uh, the material and, and uh, intangible heritage uh, against global globalization, basically, and, and uh, all these issues around, you know, world culture taking mm. over. Right. Yeah, that's a very interesting um uh question um yeah i think for us you know from my point of view you know we try um our best in what we can do now um you know in terms of uh, uh managing you know the 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 information um yeah in terms of intangible cultural heritage one way was for in the example of tonga and vanuatu you know they didn't work on their own they partnered with unesco um as a partner to help them protect the laka laka dance the sang uh, the sang dance in in tonga and also the sand drawing in vanuatu so there is like one solution that we need to collaborate with others who are good in that field so that they can be able to provide you know technological advice that we may not have so i think um partnership and collaboration is key uh in order for us to protect you know the the language uh, to protect our songs to protect our uh, intangible cultural heritage like the sand drawing you know in vanuatu so that other people do not copy and and benefit from it financially or benefit from it and steal the information but now we want to encourage more islands in the pacific to do the same so tonga and vanuatu we want to congratulate them for starting uh, taking the lead in uh, inscribing their dance inscribing the sand drawing maybe you know new caledonia and fiji and solomon islands we need to follow suit and identify some other areas in the field of intangible cultural heritage to be protected as well but we cannot do it alone we have to work with others mm -hmm.